It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Edward Kondrat, MD, CCH, DHT. He is a board certified ophthalmologist. He's also certified in classic homeopathy. He is the author of five best selling books and the clinical director of integrative medicine at the American Medical College of Homeopathy in Phoenix. He is also the husband of Lee Kondroit. Um, he has lectured widely on alternative medicine and eye disease, and he hosts a weekly radio show called Healthy Vision. He has a 50-acre wellness center located in Dade, Dade City, Florida, which is 45 minutes north of Tampa. Please welcome Dr. Kondroit. Thank you. Uh, it's, is the mic on? Okay, it's a real pleasure to be here. No? No mic? Ah, there it is. Yeah. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. And what I'd like to do is just to go through some of the changes that took place in my practice, going from a very traditional eye surgeon to maybe a far out alternative doctor. Uh, I have updated this lecture, and this, you can download the, the slides at that URL, healingtheeye.com forward slash dental, capital D, dot PDF. I had a smile on my face when I arrived in Puerto Rico because it's very appropriate. The Puerto Rican Golf Open is held during the dental conference. At the country club I belonged to, the dentists were always the best golfers. And usually I had a rule of thumb. Whenever a dentist told me his handicap, I divided it by two. That was his true handicap. And if a dentist was my partner, I knew we were going to win. But if I was playing against one, I was giving up money that day. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm a shareholder with iCell, which is a company that's more manufacturing microcurrent uh, device for eye disease. Also, I'm a medical consultant with Inspirstar and Avazia Corp. Do you need new glasses? <laughs> this is a story of my life, trying to convince people that they do need to wear their glasses. Or they got to change their perspective and vision on life. Now I started out my career as a very good eye surgeon. I thought there wasn't any eye problem that I could not correct with surgery. Very aggressive surgeon, had my own surgical center. I was doing every operation possible. Then something happened to me. I developed severe asthma. I almost died twice, and traditional medicine let me down. Uh, the asthma medications that I took gave me a bad tremor, and you can't be a good surgeon if you have a tremor. Then I was taking a beta blocker to get rid of the tremor. That was making my asthma worse. That was my life. I took one homeopathic remedy and it cured me of my asthma. This was when traditional, uh, the medical profession told me there was no cure. And that opened up my eyes and I began to study homeopathy and incorporate it into my practice. Finally, my results were so good with homeopathy, I just abandoned my traditional ophthalmology practice. And now for the last 20 years, it's been devoted to alternative treatments. There's a dramatic increase in eye diseases worldwide. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, it's going from 28 million today to 43 million by the year 2020. And of course, most of you in the room know the reasons why. Heavy metal toxicity, our poor pathetic diet, toxins in the environment, and stress. And of course, as uh, integrative dentists, you have a very important role in taking care of the oral health, which I feel contributes to many, many eye problems. Here's an example of dry macular degeneration. And you can see these um, little accumulations of lipofusin in the retina, which are toxic accumulation. Here's a picture of wet macular degeneration. And as a practicing ophthalmologist, there really wasn't much we could do with these diseases except maybe put the patient on some vitamins and that was about it. Of course, now they have injections for the wet macular degeneration, but studies have come out to indicate that there's an extremely high risk with these injections. A recent study uh, uh, revealed that 20% of patients that get these injections will develop retinal atrophy, atrophy, which is a serious problem. 
Glaucoma is another uh, disease that we're seeing more and more of. Uh, we measure glaucoma by the peripheral fields. And you can see here when you have a, this black area is loss of vision in a peripheral field. As a traditional ophthalmologist, I was told once you have this field damage, nothing can be done. But I am seeing patients now with alternative treatments to reverse this damage. And I'll show you some slides to illustrate this. Also in glaucoma, you have damage to the optic nerve. Uh, this is called a cup. And as the disease progresses, this white area becomes larger and larger. And we have uh, uh, devices that we can actually measure the size of the cup to measure the progression or resolution of the disease. Recently, I published uh, the results of 152 of patients involved in using these alternative treatments. And this is being accepted. And it will be published this year in Alternative Therapies in Health and Disease. And this is a summary of uh, uh, patients and conditions that I treated. Uh, you can see it varies from age-related macular degeneration. That was the majority, glaucoma, wet macular, macular hole, macular wrinkling, puck, pucker. I'm seeing much more of these in my practice, and I think it's related to dirty electricity, especially the smart meters. It's often their history involved of a smart meter being insp installed in the home. Or I've had recently a couple of patients come in with macular problems on one side, and guess what? That's the side they're using their cell phone. So you have to be aware of these things. Cataracts, ischemic optic neuropathy, and so forth. So the modalities that I used, a homeopathy, microcurrent, pulse electromagnetic field, IV nutrition, oxidative treatments, and light therapy. And this is a summary of the visual uh, improvement. Two lines or more, 15%. One line or more, 54%. Uh, no change. So you can see the majority, 92% of the patients, had an improvement of vision. And this is a disease where a traditional ophthalmologist will tell you that once you lose your vision, you can't regain it. It's a progressive disease. You're not going to get better. You're just going to get worse. So these therapies do work. So an example of somebody with glaucoma, total loss of vision in the upper field after three days of treatment, it's normal. I mean, how do you explain this? Another one, this is macular degeneration with a loss of field here after three days of treatment. A patient with a uh, sectional defect due to a segmental uh, retinal artery occlusion after three days of treatment. So let's look at these modalities. And the question that I have is, what modalities are really the workhorse? When patients come to me, I do many different modalities. And I'm always wondering which one has the greatest effect. So we're, let's look at the treatments that I used. So I think it comes down to microcurrent and light therapy, because the Mars cocktail, which is an IV nutritional vitamin, they only get one, and alternative doctors report that it takes maybe three months of these IVs, nutritional IVs, before you can see a significant change in vision. Same thing with ozone therapy. Doctors that are doing ozone definitely can have an improvement with ocular disease, but usually it takes three to six months. Uh, homeopathy in this series of uh, cases uh, uh, didn't give the effect because the remedy was given when the patient was discharged. So my philosophy has changed. I went from this board certified ophthalmologist who believed that surgery could cure all disease. And now I'm going into more subtle energies like microcurrent and homeopathy. So there's the mechanistic versus the vitalistic perspective. The mechanists hold that life obeys the laws of chemistry and physics. The body is like a machine as a defect. You correct the engine, you give it the right amount of gasoline and oil, it's going to work. The vitalists believe that life will never be explained by chemistry and physics. There's a subtle energy that takes place. And by changing that subtle energy, we can cure a person who's in disharmony. And that's what happened to me when I had my asthma. There was no mechanistic approach. I was given this bizarre homeopathic remedy in a dilution of 1 to 10,000 or so and it cured me of my asthma. 
I was recently at a meeting in, in Baskin Palmer and it seems like the medical profession is getting deeper and deeper into the structure of the body. And you look at some of these talks, uh, subcellular basis of how retinal pigment epithelial autofluoresces, uh, determination of extracellular matrix change in the inner choroid of subjects. I mean, my goodness, uh, update on reticular pseudodrusin. So that's one extreme the really scientific studies. Now let's look at another group called ICM. The whole person, caught, uh, person caring, uh, the way of gong, in-depth view of your sacred anatomy, healing music, spiritual sound technology, integrative treatments of post-traumatic stress disease, consciousness in the womb. So you have these two extremes and I hate to say it, but I'm hitting more towards this extreme and I seem to be getting better results. So this is currently my hierarchy of healing. When I see somebody with eye disease, I think homeopathy has the greatest effect. I see true miracles with homeopathy. Next, light and sound therapies, then microcurrent. Microcurrent, I feel, is using subtle energies, frequencies, vibrations. It can be very similar to homeopathy. Then we have nutrition, functional medicine, petrochemical, pharmacy, and then surgery. So this is my current state of hierarchy of disease. So my goodness, so let's look. What is homeopathy? You see all these homeopathic remedies. Um, I mean, there's thousands of them and different ways of prescribing. But I like these two quotes, one by Dizzy Gillespie and Mark Twain. Uh, there have been two great revolutions in my life. The first was bebop, the second was homeopathy. Mark Twain I may honestly feel grateful that homeopathy survived the attempts of allopaths to destroy it. It all goes back to Samuel Hahnemann. Samuel Hahnemann was very disgruntled, a very disgruntled physician. They were doing bloodletting at the time, purging toxic medications, and he abandoned medicine and began to look at a different way of approaching disease. And the way he developed homeopathy was uh, he was doing a translation and it was noted that the Peruvian bark, because of its stringent, astringent qualities, uh, was excellent for treating malaria. He said, this doesn't make sense. So he began taking the Peruvian bark or cincona and he developed malaria symptoms. And this is called the law of similars. And this was the first proving. All of our homeopathic remedies have gone extensive proving tests. In fact, much more than any FDA regulated pharmaceutical. Because in homeopathy, when we do approving, we look at the spectrum of how it affects the body, the mental, spiritual, and emotional levels. So he proved over 100 different remedies, and this became the foundation of homeopathy. Now, I have a question for you. Who was the first homeopath? It wasn't Samuel Hahnemann. And I like to bring this up to you know, Christians who say that homeopathy is the work of the devil or necromancy. It was actually Moses was the first homeopath. Exodus 23:20, and he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire, ground it into powder, stewed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. This is exactly how we make our homeopathic remedies. We grind it, we put it in powder, we put it in water, and we make you drink it. And it acts as a catalyst to help your body heal. The law of similars is kind of interesting. And the best way I, I can explain this, if our body has an intelligence and we're made in the wisdom and likeness of God, when we get sickness and disease, it's because our body needs to have this event. We need the disease and sickness to maintain homeostasis or balance. Traditional doctors treat with opposites. So if you have a fever, you get something to lower your fever. If you have diarrhea, you get something that causes constipation. You have high eye pressure, you take something to lower it. But homeopathy, because we believe the body has an intelligence, we give you something that actually causes those symptoms. And you may be saying, what? Are you nuts? That's going to make the person worse. But mysteriously, it doesn't. When I was cured of my asthma, I was given a homeopathic remedy that actually produces asthma. For some reason, my body need to have an asthma state, so I took a remedy to help my body do what it wants to do, and that's kind of the philosophy in homeopathy. Um, 
But, you know, we, we see this homeopathic approach even in modern medicine with allergy treatment. If you're allergic to ragweed and you go to the allergist, he gives you dilute injections of ragweed. And you say, hey, doc, you're nuts. I'm allergic to this stuff. Why are you giving it to me? Well, the law of similars, the, the very substance that causes a disease can treat it. Immunization to a certain extent. Radiation therapy is used to treat cancer, yet we know that radiation can cause cancer. Digitalis in a toxic dose will cause heart failure, but in a small dose it treats heart failure. Ritalin is an amphetamine, yet it's given to kids that are hyperactive, so it's kind of strange. I'm going to go over this. So the homeopathic evaluation is based on the respect and understanding of the individual. We look at the mental, emotional, and physical patterns. So if I see 100 people with macular degeneration, each one may receive a different homeopathic remedy. Now what's this business about dilution? I mean, how can that possibly work? And this is one of the reasons why homeopathy is made fun of, because we dilute our substances to such a fine degree. But based on this law of dilution, the more dilute a substance becomes, the stronger, which is just contrary to the pharmaceutical industry. Now I practice classical homeopathy. I believe in one remedy at a time, and I think when you mix and give a person multiple remedies and polypharmacy, you're diluting the frequency. When you administer a pure frequency, you have the greatest effect. And I know many of you use uh, polypharmacy, different mixtures and tinctures. They work. But the classical approach, and the majority of homeopaths in the world pla practice classical homeopathy, this is the way to get the best result. There are many articles published that show the validity of homeopathy. I'm just going to go over these quickly. This was an article published in Nature magazine. Very dilute serum against IgE. And uh, when dilutions of IgE from 1 to 10 to the second power to 10 to the 120 power still had an effect on degranulation of basophils. So it seems like the energy of this anti-IgE was still in solution even with extreme dilutions. Uh, this was published in Lancet, uh, a randomized placebo-controlled study showed that homeopathy is just not a placebo effect. Uh, another article here. This was the lead article in the journal Pediatrics, which um, really ruffled a lot of feathers in the pediatric specialty. A randomized double-blind clinical trial the treatment group had statistically significant decrease in duration of diarrhea with homeopathic remedies. Uh, and this is another double blind study looking at allergy sufferers. So there is a lot of stuff. But let's go back into the eye literature. This was published in 1891 by Dr. Norton looking at the treatment of senile cataracts. And this was a retrospective study where he went back into his records. He treated 295 patients with homeopathy that had cataracts, and it was an improvement in 58% of the cases in terms of their vision. Now, I want to give you some of my personal experience that really convinced me that homeopathy has a lot of power. Early on, when I was studying homeopathy, a radiologist came to me with a sudden loss of blindness in his left eye. And he was evaluated by the retinal service. They told him he had a central retinal artery occlusion. Nothing could be done. They put him on Coumadin to keep his blood thin. But he was from India, and he knew that homeopathy could have a potential to help him, so he came to me. And in homeopathy, we just don't treat the eye disease. We treat the person. He was very loquacious. And it was interesting in our conversation, he says, I love to argue. He said, even if I know that I'm wrong in the argument, I'll just wear the other person down until I win. He had that talent. And I said to him, well, what happened around the time you lost your vision? And he thought for a while and he said, I lost an argument to my wife. So to me, that was the case. There was that traumatic event. He lost an argument to his wife. So physical exam, he had bare light perception in in the involved eye, could barely see light, and uh, there were some pupillary changes. So I gave him a homeopathic remedy that kind of fit his emotional and mental state, and also was a remedy for an arterial occlusion. And he had complete return 
of his vision in three days, a complete return. And we were taught in medical school, in my ophthalmology training, once you get a central retinal artery occlusion, nothing can be done. That's it. And I've had several cases of occlusions that have resolved with homeopathy. To give you an idea how we look at the whole person, this is a 78-year-old female who came with macular degeneration, cataracts, and a balance problem. Now, of course, you know, the traditional eye doctor would remove the cataracts, probably go to a neurologist or ear, nose, and throat specialist for the balance problems, and everybody would dissect this person into each segmental part. No one would treat her as an individual. But in homeopathy, we treat the whole person. So, um, you know, I took a history, but it was interesting that an important aspect of her life was ballroom dancing. She loved to dance. Also, her sexual drive was never very high. And so when we look at these peculiar things, they point to a homeopathic remedy. And the physical exam showed advanced cataracts and myopic degeneration and a marked reduction of her vision. So she was given sepia, which is a homeopathic remedy that is very effective in the treatment of cataracts. And also it's for people who like physical activity, like dancing, and they have, uh, uh, according to the repertory, have a very low sexual drive. And so she had a 70% improvement of her vision. This is without cataract surgery. No more dizziness. And she was now back and no more ringing in her ears and she was back to ballroom dancing. So these are the kind of things that when I see these changes in people, that's why I love homeopathy so much. You know, they come to me for an eye problem and the right homeopathic remedy, you know, my goodness, it changes their life. So you're all thinking, what about dental homeopathic remedies? Well, aconite is a big one. It's great fear or anxiety going to the dentist. And maybe that should be sprayed into the dental offices. Merxol is a good remedy for the first signs of dental uh, discomfort. Hypericum, injury to dental nerves, very good remedy. In fact, this is a remedy I use very frequently when I was doing laser surgery on the eye. Uh, because the cornea is a really rich plexus of nerves, and this helped relieve eye pain. Arnica, most of us who have studied a little bit of homeopathy know that Arnica is great uh, for trauma, shock to the body, physical shock. I always travel with Arnica anytime I'm hiking or doing any type of physical activity. Arnica is a wonderful remedy. Um, Hypericum, uh, shooting pains in the sensory nerves. Ruta uh, is another one for tooth extraction to reduce pain, and Staphysagria. Uh, this is a, a textbook on dental homeopathy for dental surgeons by uh, Dr. Lessel. You can probably get this on Amazon.com, which sums it up. The interesting thing about homeopathy, these remedies don't have a, an organ-specific effect. So, for example, belladonna is used to treat acute inflammation. It could be acute inflammation on your eye, it could be acute inflammation in your ear, it could be a, acute dental inflammation of a tooth. So these remedies have a certain pattern or characteristic that once you learn these remedies, you can use them for different parts of your body. Now this is something that really blew me away and kind of confirmed homeopathy. I read an article about a guy that claims he can cure 100% of cancer using a certain energy method. His name is Bill Bankston, and his website is up here, Bankston Research. 100% cure of cancer, and this is confirmed with animal studies. There's a line of mice that the, when they're injected with adenomammary carcinoma, they all die within 27 days. And this is kind of the, the, the line that they use to study chemotherapy. Do they live longer than 27 days? Well, Bankston doing his technique with his healing touch cures 100% of them. They all live. And he's published this. And when they're re-injected with the cancer cells, they don't get the cancer. He also discovered that the healing energy could be transferred to water. And I'm thinking, that's like homeopathy. We transfer the healing energy to water. Then he found out that the effect in water increases if it's diluted. 
So if you take the water and you dilute it by tenfold or a hundredfold, it becomes stronger when he treats the mice. It has a stronger effect. He also found out that um, there's always an aggravation. And in homeopathy, often you get worse before you get better. And he found out, and this is really something that caused concern with me, there's interference with other energy treatments. And when you mix his healing technique with acupuncture or some type of other therapy, uh, uh, energetic therapy, there's a decrease in effect. So this kind of supports the business about when you start mixing homeopathic remedies, you have a decrease in effect because the energy or the vibration is diluted or interfered with. Another big interest of mine is microcurrent, and I was really happy. I was here in Puerto Rico, May 25th on my birthday, teaching a group of Puerto Rican doctors, and this was the lead article in the New York Times Magazine, all about the body electric and microcurrent. So mainstream medicine is becoming interested in microcurrent. Uh, James Oshman, who wrote the book Energy Medicine, he has a theory that the cell receptor theory uh, cell receptor theory that we're all taught in medical school, the way that pharmaceutical drugs work, that they go in, they bind to a cell receptor and have a physiological reaction, he feels it doesn't exist. That every pharmaceutical agent that you ingest or take has a certain frequency or vibration. And that's how the effect of the drug takes place. And this is being confirmed by some Stanford statistician too, that when we take a drug, it's the frequency uh, Robert Becker in his book, The Body Electric, discusses um, that the body is an electrical uh, organism. We need uh, the flow of electricity for health and disease, and he's done remarkable research showing that regeneration in salamanders and, and lower species of animals, the regeneration will not take place if the microcurrent flow is blocked. Now speaking of golf, I was introduced to microcurrent when I read the article about Sam Sneed. And I had the pleasure of actually treating Sam Sneed for a week for his macular degeneration. And in exchange, he gave me golf lessons. So everybody wants to know what Sam told me when he watched my, looked at my golf swing. Well, he had me hit a bucket of balls. Then he had me hit a second bucket. Came up to me, put his arm around me. He says, Dr. Condrat, here's what I want you to do. Just cut back for a year and then just give it up. <laughs> So I took Sam's advice, and I no longer play golf. Now Lance Armstrong, in addition to his blood doping, his team routinely used microcurrent for recovery. And here's another athlete over here, myself and my wife, we did the Marine Corps Marathon, and I had no business running the Marine Corps Marathon. It's 26.2 miles, I'm overweight, I'm out of shape, but I did it because my son was his first marathon, and I was aching. I could barely walk, I couldn't get out of bed, I was suffering. One 30 minute microcurrent treatment completely took away all my pain. Truly, truly phenomenal. My wife and I, we did the Camino de Santiago, a 500 mile pilgrimage in northern Spain. Uh, and we had to walk 20 miles every day. And you try walking 20 miles every day for a month. Your body is pretty sore and beautiful scenery in northern Spain. I, th I think I had the best time of my life uh, walking and visiting all these sacred sites and exercising every day. But my microcurrent machine, every night, here's me treating my feet, and here's me holding the gloves and running a program through this. Now this is interesting. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Max Pulse. Well, this is me. Look at the mental stress off the chart. I did one 15 minute microcurrent treatment. This is what happened, dramatically reduced. So I travel everywhere with my microcurrent machine to reduce stress because I tell patients, stress is a component of your disease. You gotta reduce stress. And microcurrent does that extremely, extremely effectively. This is a book I wrote um, 15 years ago, microcurrent miracle eye cure and for the last 15 years I've been trying to introduce this therapy to my fellow ophthalmologist but no one is really interested so now I've trained 
about 20 integrative doctors who are doing my program for patients uh, microcurrent. So microcurrent uh, improves blood flow, stimulates cellular activity, removes scar tissue, reduces inflammation, has a neuroprotective effect. If you search in PubMed, you'll find hundreds of articles dealing with each one of these parameters. Probably one of the top articles that we always refer to is the study by Cheng, and this was published in the Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research. He looked at the effects of microcurrent on the skin of the rat, and he determined that between 50 and 500 microamps will cause an increase in mitochondrial activity and an increase of 300 to 500 percent of ATP levels. My goodness, we're stimulating those cells by 300 to 500 percent. We're taking dysfunctional cells and we're really ramping, ramping them up with microcurrent. It also balances the autonomic nervous system, reduces stress, treats neuropathies, treats depression, detox, and there's some patents out there that shows that it stimulates stem cells. It can lower intraocular pressure, reverse macular degeneration. The number one use of microcurrent in the world is facial rejuvenation and corrects musculoskeletal problems. These are some studies that were done demonstrating the effect of microcurrent in improving circulation. Uh, patients with blockage of the arteries of their lower leg after TENS treatments, uh, the majority of patients had an improvement of circulation. Um, this is a study, Raynaud's disease and diabetic retinopathy, or diabetic neuropathy, I'm sorry. Uh, I like this study because this is a group of patients that had resistant standard, resisted standard medical approaches. And after the microcurrent, 80% of them had successful healing of the, of the ulcers. Uh, there's also some articles published in the ophthalmology literature, and this was presented at a major ophthalmology meeting showing that microcurrent has a neuroprotective effect, and the conclusion was that low-frequency electroacupuncture may be an alternative therapy in the treatment of glaucoma. And this is an article here that looked at the effect of microcurrent in terms of stimulating stem cells. So this idea of frequency specific or microcurrent, and I think the terminology, terminology is changing. Now we're talking about microcurrent as a signaling device. It sends a signal to have a certain physiological effect on the body. So each tissue in the body has a unique frequency or vibration. And when we match the frequency like two tuning forks, we cause a harmony. And this is very similar you know, to homeopathy. Homeopathy, when you take a homeopathic remedy, it has a unique frequency of vibration. And if it matches your frequency and vibration, it has a positive effect. So to me, there's a lot of similarities between microcurrent and homeopathy. Carol McMakin is a brilliant chiropractor who's done a lot of research in terms of using microcurrent for uh, musculoskeletal disorders. And this is a book that she published. And so the modern frequency specific, we use uh, thousands of different frequencies ranging from 0 0.01 to 999 hertz with varying intensities. And based on Cheng's study, we really want to keep the current at a low level. Once you get above 500 or 600 microamps, it actually decreases cellular activity. That's why you have to be very careful with a lot of inexpensive TENS devices. They have a high current. It's good for blocking pain if you have back pain or musculoskeletal, but my main use for microcurrent is stimulating activity. Stimulating activity and balancing the neuroendocrine uh, functions. So remember I, I talked about these signals. So these are some common signals for pathology. 40 is inflammation, chronic inflammation, spasm, hemorrhage. So when I'm treating the eye, I send in a frequency of 40 for inflammation. Maybe if they have hemorrhage, I send it in 18. And then uh, we use channel B or tissue. So these are some of the uh, dental frequencies. Teeth, 41, lips, 274, mouth, 124, gums, tongue, membranes of the mouth. So, 
If you have somebody with a periodontal disease with inflammation, you may, run, may want to run 40 and 70 in. So um, I think that microcurrent has an amazing potential in dentistry. Very simple to use and it's something that I think can reduce inflammation and help you get better results post-surgically. Some of the top plastic surgeons are using microcurrent post-operatively to reduce inflammation and help stimulate healing. Remember, the number one use of microcurrent is facial rejuvenation. So if you can reduce inflammation, help stimulate healing, mobilize those stem cells, you are going to get much better results. So we combine frequencies. So 40 and 70, I forgot what 70 was. 70 is the gums. Um, we can run 40, 284, 18, 18 is hemorrhage. 970 is interesting, that's the emotional component. And every time I do a treatment, I always run the emotional component. And I have no idea what the emotional component of the gums are, but I would run it. I don't have the, any idea what the emotional component of the retina is, but it seems to be a very effective frequency because we know, and I feel, that every disease that we have has an emotional component. And if we treat that, we're going to get much better results. Now this is really exciting. I was approached by a, um, a California businessman who's already taken to market uh, several devices for microcurrent. And he has patents on uh, free, uh, signals that release VEGF factors which cause new blood vessels to grow. Uh, release of SDF1 stem cell homing device, signals to proliferate stem cells and so forth. These are all patents. And he has taken to market a device called MyoStem which helps regenerate cardiac muscle. And he has uh, patented and marketed devices to treat diabetic ulcers, uh, critical limb ischemia, and now the new company is called iCell. And actually, on the books is something called dental cell. He's going to be taking microcurrent devices and instruments for the dental profession to use. So the, in, when we began using microcurrent, we had these crude devices where you had to turn these knobs and you put 40 on one, 70 on the other, and hit the button to run, to run the frequency. So if you ran 20 or 30 frequency pairs, it was very time consuming. And this is the example of the, the changes. So I felt that there had to be a method of a programming, have like a reprogrammable device, have a computer chip that you could write the frequencies you want, then deliver them to the patient. I met with several engineering firms, this was uh, 10 years ago, and all of them wanted a thirty dollars to $40,000 retainer to develop such a device. And they, were, they weren't very optimistic. They told me even if we could, the FDA wouldn't approve it. I was frustrated, so I decided to go to Arizona State University, and I signed up for a master's program in electrical engineering, just to hang out with the geeks, to try to find out what was going on. So while I was there, I met this guy named Ning Wu. He's a third generation electrical engineer. His father is professor of electrical engineering at Beijing University, and Ning is just beyond brilliant. I don't call him Ning Wu anymore, I call him Ning Wow. <laughs> and in six months, he developed a programmable machine. Almost looks like an Apple iPhone that you can program unlimited number of frequency pairs with your laptop computer and put them in. So now, we're programming frequency patterns that we can either deliver with gloves or probes or electrodes for patients. This is an example how we treat the eye. So I think there could very easily be application in treating the gums with this, inflammation, etc. This is how we do the detox and stress. And this is one of the ways when I'm flying on the airplane and I'm stressed, I just hold these gloves and I get a microcurrent treatment. We also can treat, um, help detoxify the body here and do a body treatment like this by administering the current. And one of my favorite ways is administering the current into a hot tub. This is a picture of my wife and we're in a hot tub getting the microcurrent. And you may be thinking, my mother told me never take electrical equipment in a hot tub. Well, we're putting the wires in there and remember it's not the current, it's the frequency or vibration. So that frequency or vibration is going into the water which has an amazing physiological effect. While I was doing the Camino, we had some tough days hiking and I decided there's a lot of talk about energized water. 
uh, Cancun, ASEA. I said, why don't I try microcurrent to make my own energized water? So I ran some inflammation frequencies in water, and we had our, a tough day. We had a 30-mile day. We finally got to the end of the day. We had five miles to go uphill. And I said to my wife, honey, let's try, try this magic microcurrent water. So we both started to drink it, and it was amazing. Our bodies became re-energized. I don't know if it was a placebo effect, but we ended up surviving the day when we were both starting to look for a taxi cab to take us to our next destination. So I think one of the three biggest areas that we treat are the brain balancing, detox, and relaxation. When you balance the neurological centers, that's when you get some of the best effects. And we have frequencies of the nervous system here and different frequencies of different parts of the brain. And the stress protocol is kind of interesting. Remember I mentioned 970 is the frequency for the emotional component? So um, when we treat somebody, uh, like for example the liver, 970-35 is the emotional component of the liver. We know in Chinese medicine it's anger and frustration. 970-27 is the colon, that's fair and tear, but I don't have any of uh, uh, the dental, but if you were going to be running a stress program in your dental practice, you may put in the gums, the teeth, the lips, all the different dental components with 970. My favorite is 970-33. That's the heart, restore joy. And sometimes when I'm under a lot of stress, I just run that frequency, and it's just very, very, up, very, very uplifting. And this is a device we developed, um, uh, very simple. We had the brain balancing, detox, and relaxation. I gave a seminar, and I was really upset with how slow they were learning, and I had everybody put on the brain, brain machine so that I'll become better students. So when not to use microcurrent? Uh, pacemaker, seizure disorder. Now the FDA states it should not be used if you have a pacemaker, but usually when a cardiologist finds out, finds out that the current is so low, they kind of snicker and say, well, there's really no problem. And I've treated hundreds of patients with pacemakers with microcurrent. Same thing with seizure disorder. I think microcurrent can be effective for treating seizure disorders. That shouldn't be a contraindication. Also, you have to be practical. I think if you have sight-threatening conditions that have a better surgical outcome, like a retinal detachment or uncontrolled glaucoma, optic neuritis, uh, and usually what I tell patients is, you know, I'm looking at instituting these alternative treatments to strengthen your body and your eye so you do better. But if you're doing the alternative treatments and your vision is getting worse, then you need to go with the conventional uh, traditional ophthalmology, surgery or injections. So we do offer some microcurrent training. We have different levels of microcurrent. We have our get started microcurrent level one. And I just wanted to mention those of you from up north and um, if you're enjoying the warm weather, next month we have a chelation conference. Chelation and other detox methods to save your life. I don't know if Carl McMillan's in the audience. Carl, are you here? Uh, he's an integrative dentist. It's going to be a featured speaker talking about chelation. And then we have our annual microcurrent conference, uh, which is going to be held in Phoenix. So if you do have an interest, this is a great conference. It's uh, four days. You'll learn all aspects of microcurrent, including a potential aspect in uh, dentistry. And this is the website, microcurrent2015.com, to get some more information. So I want to thank you for your attention, and this is the URL if you wanted to download um, uh, uh, all the new updated slides that I have. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Just a quick announcement. We have a